My name is John Petrini. I'm a gastroenterologist here at Sansom Clinic. I've been working in gastroenterology for about 35 years. Um, for those of you that don't know, colonoscopy's only been around since 1967. The guy that first did the first colonoscopy is still doing colonoscopy. It's a, it's a great test that helps people um, a lot. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight, and, and we hope to be able to demystify things and, and answer any questions that you might have. In your seat, you'll find a clipboard with a pen and a form. We ask that you fill out the form. It gives a lot of money to us if you do that. Um, following the presentations, we'll have nurses and educators as well as physicians around. The nurses and educators will help you to review the form and explain how to sign up for colonoscopy if you haven't had one yet. If you need a Spanish form, see the volunteer in the back. And be aware that tonight's presentation is being interpreted by our translator, Lourdes Garcia Campbell. And she will, um, so if you hear some soft talking in the back, that's what it's going to be. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you my colleague for the last uh, 24, 25 years, Dr. James Egan. Jim um, graduated from medical school at UC San Diego. He went to the University of California, San Francisco, where he did his internship and residency and was chief resident in medicine before he joined um, UCLA, where he did his fellowship in gastroenterology. And I was uh, very fortunate to be able to entice Jim to come up here to do his practice with me for the last 25 years. It's been a great thing. And he's done, I, I don't know, maybe 45,000 colonoscopies. And um, between the two of us, we're over 100,000. It's, 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 a, it's a really interesting thing. Um, and he's going to talk to us about demystifying screening colonoscopy. Please welcome Dr. Egan. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody, for coming. There are a few other gastroenterologists here, Dr. Kovacs and Dr. Aguirre. So I think the combined, we're probably well over almost 200,000 colonoscopy experiences in this room. Who's clicking the slides for me? Great, thanks. So tonight, I'm going to divide my talk into four sections, and I'll do this very quickly. If there are questions afterwards, please feel free to ask me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the scope of colon cancer in this country, a little bit about the biology of colon cancer, some screening tests that we do, and then at the end, some of the economic implications. Before I start, I wanted to introduce Mike McGrew. Mike was diagnosed with colon cancer November? October, and he's gracious enough to come tonight, and I think at the end he might want to say a few words, but we appreciate both him and his wife are here. Thank you for coming. I, yeah. Thank you. I start off with the first slide. Many of you probably have had colonoscopies in this room. Some of you have not. I don't think that young man in the back has had one yet. But if you go to your doctor and you have a, and he says for a colonoscopy, it might feel something like this. The doctor's telling the patient, you don't need a colonoscopy, but I'm sending you one because, quite frankly, I don't like you. <laughs> and it might seem like that's what happens. Slide. Colon cancer is common in this country. It is the third most common cause of cancer. It's the second most common cause of cancer death. And if you develop colon cancer and die from it, you're going to use, lose, on the average, 13 years of your life. A, an average person at age 50 with no risk factors has a 5% lifetime risk of getting colon cancer and a 2.5% risk of dying from that colon cancer. Colon cancer awareness is increasing, primarily in part for groups like this, but probably more importantly is that someone pays for it. The government, Medicare pays for it, and so do many insurance companies. And that's helping to allow people to obtain colonoscopies. Many of you may remember Katie Couric many years ago had her colonoscopy on TV and that also assuaged a lot of the apprehension for colonoscopy. Next slide. This is just a slide to show that the incidence is both in men and women of equal percentage, as are the deaths from colon cancer. So this does not discriminate. This is a very important slide. This slide shows the age at which someone develops colon cancer. And as you can see, the slope of this curve becomes quite steep at around age 50. So it's not by accident that screening colonoscopies are generally recommended at age 50, but this is primarily the reason why. You could do them earlier, and we know we're missing some people who are gonna get colon cancer under 50, but the cost of that would probably be prohibitive. But there are some patients, and we'll talk about that in a minute, who will require a colonoscopy earlier. These are some famous people that probably should have had a colonoscopy. That's Vince Lombardi. 
coach of the Green Bay Packers in the 1960s. He won the Super Bowl. He knew he was having rectal bleeding, but he refused to have an examination. As John mentioned, colonoscopy was available in the late 60s, and it probably would have saved his life or at least lengthened it. Audrey Hepburn died in the early 80s of colon cancer. She was never screened. Tammy Faye Baker died recently of colon cancer. And the top picture is, that's Claude Debussy, the composer. He died of colon cancer, but they did not have colonoscopy, so it was not an option for him. People with colon cancer present with a variety of symptoms. None of these are very good, because when you have a symptom from colon cancer, it generally implies that that cancer is advanced. But abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, rectal bleeding are all subjective symptoms, as is weight loss. And if you see a physician and they find that you're anemic from iron deficiency, the number one thing doctors will rule out is a, is a neoplastic process in the colon. There is direct, indirect evidence that colorectal cancer develops primarily from polyps in the colon referred to as adenomas. This is important. It may take a long time for an adenoma to become a malignancy, and that's called a dwell time. And that's important because that's what allows, unlike other malignancies, colon cancer to be screened because there's a long lag interval from the time you get a pre-malignant lesion to when you may develop a cancer. And then finally, there is supporting evidence, and I'll talk about that towards the end, to support screening individuals both for early cancer and prevention of colon cancer. This is a polyp. It has a small stock. If you go back to that just for a second. And these are what we remove. This is a luminal picture of an actual colonoscopic polyp. If these are not taken out, Next slide. Some of these may progress to what is a neoplastic or malignant process in the colon. This cannot be removed endoscopically, and it will require surgical intervention. A little bit about the biology of colon cancer with the next slide. We know that polyps progress. It takes a long time, but there's a series of progressions that allow that polyp to enlarge and develop progressive neoplastic cells that can become invasive, which is shown on the far left of your slide. More biology is known with regards to the genetic progression. This is ver fairly well understood what happens in these polyps. A series of genetic alterations that allow the polyp to grow, become malignant, and then further abnormalities that allow that polyp to metastasize. We just don't know why this happens, but we know what happens. It's important that you remember towards the end of the talk when I show those genetic abnormalities, those are what are being used for doing stool analysis that many of you may have heard about, and we'll touch upon that. Next slide. This is another schematic of, of the stages of colon cancer, and you can see as it goes from stage zero to stage four, the, can the polyp usually enlarges and the cancer cells invade lymphatics and then spread, and unfortunately, if you, if you have metastatic disease, next slide, an imaging study may show lesions in the liver, and this is metastatic colon cancer, and the five-year survival of this condition is less than, less than 10%. Next slide. Just a brief note about these polyps. These are, may behave biologically somewhat different. These are small, what we call serrated sessile adenomas. And you can see these are subtle. These are actual colonoscopic pictures. And these are things that occur more commonly in the right side of the colon, and I'll get to that in a minute. But these are something that most gastroenterologists are looking for quite closely because these may be missed and these may be maybe contribute to what we call missed lesions that develop into colon cancer. This is just a simple schematic of your colon. You have your anus, rectum, left colon, transverse colon, and then you have what is called the ascending colon. When we do a colonoscopy, we actually work backwards. So the end of the colonoscope, when we're done, will be actually at the beginning of the colon. Next slide. We have a number of instruments to look at the colon. Anoscopy will look at the lower part of the colon. A rigid sigmoidoscope, many of you who are old enough in here may have had the pleasure of having that exam. This is actually a rigid steel tube. And it's used to straighten out the sigmoid colon and look for lesions. Not done very frequently anymore. We have a flexible sigmoidoscope that is actually a shorter version of a colonoscope. And then finally we have a colonoscope that is intended to visualize the entire colon. This is uh, an idealized picture of a colon. We, all, we wish that all colonoscopies were this straight. But this shows the colonoscope traversing the whole colon. I want you to pay attention to the end of the colonoscope. And that location is called the cecum. That is the beginning part of your colon that is 
joined by what is called your small bowel, your terminal ileum, and that's where the appendiceal orifice is. This is felt to be a complete colonoscopy when the entire colon can be visualized, including the cecum. The business end of the colonoscope you can see in the picture on the far right, and the colonoscope has an instrument channel, a light, an irrigation device, and a video lens. And that's what allows us to both remove lesions and take photographs. Next line. This is not the kind of colon we generally like to see during colonoscopy. This is someone who had a barium enema, and you can see that the colon traverses everywhere. And this is what's called a redundant colon. But even despite this configuration, most gastroenterologists are able to visualize the entire colon. Next line. We can take polyps off. This is a very simple schematic where we put a, a snare. It's a wire device like a lasso that we can put around the base of a polyp and transect it. That polyp is then removed for pathologic visualization. Next slide. This is an actual photograph of that being done, and there's a small cauterized base that we leave most of the time. These just heal up with no consequence. Rarely, you can get some bleeding from this. Next line. This is uh, another diagram that shows polyps that are flatter that we sometimes have to raise. We can inject in the mucosa and are able to remove these polyps. Colon cancer occurs throughout the whole colon. Just, if you want to just kind of remember, 50% on the left side, 50% on the right side, with the demarcation being at that area at the upper left called the splenic flexure. So you can see that if you only visualize the lower part of the colon, you may miss 50% of colon cancers. There are some risk factors for colon cancer. I'll just briefly go through these, but I, there, some of the speakers after me are gonna discuss this further. Family history, having had cancer or polyps before. As people get older, as I showed you in the slide, the risk increases. Inflammatory bowel disease can also be associated with an increased risk. African Americans tend to have an increased risk and maybe an earlier risk, and they may, those patients may need to be screened at an earlier age. And then finally, which will be touched upon in a little bit, are some lifestyle issues that can lead to colon cancer. The two best studied are smoking, patients that smoke, and obesity. Next slide. I'm not gonna to touch upon this, but I did want you to know that there are what are called polyposis syndromes. These are patients that, through a genetic predisposition, will develop numerous different types of polyps and their risk of malignancy is increased, almost sometimes 100%. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. This is someone who did have familial polyposis. You can see the numerous polyps and you can imagine how difficult it would be to remove these. And even if you could, the recurrence rate is almost 100%. So oftentimes these people will be sent for an elective colectomy where their colon's removed. What might prevent colon cancer? Well, we don't really know. There's some older data to show that calcium supplementation may help, and there's some more recent data that NSAIDs may help, but the verdict's still not out on these. I wanna switch gears a little bit, talk about screening tests, and that's really what we're talking about here is screening people for colon cancer. And in medicine, when we talk about a screening test, what we're referring to is a strategy that's used in a population to identify the possible presence of an undiagnosed disease in individuals who have no symptoms. So you're basically taking people who are asymptomatic and performing a test to see if they might have a condition of colon cancer. Next slide. Two other things that I just wanna define, and I know this, this is a little bit tricky, but it's important because when you look at, at screening tests, you wanna know is it gonna answer the question you want to have answered? And one of these is sensitivity, and what this is, it's basically a measure of the probability of correctly diagnosing a condition. In other words, if someone has the disease, is this test gonna show it? And then the, uh, the uh, corollary of that is specificity. And what that means, if someone doesn't have the disease, is this test gonna tell you that? And that last thing I mentioned there where it says false positives, when you have a screening test that has a lot of false positives, you're gonna do a lot of tests on those patients because of that positive test. And that's important when we talk about some of the data here in a second. Well, what's the rationale for screening for colon cancer? And some pretty good data. We know that most people who get colon cancer are gonna have no risk. So 80% of the people are just average people without symptoms. There are no good symptoms as we talked about because by the time you get symptoms, you've probably had a, a, an advancing carcinoma. So using symptoms is not a reliable tool. As I talked about, it takes a long time for a polyp 
to grow and transform into a malignancy called the dwell time. So that allows the opportunity to screen people. It gives us time. And then finally, five-year survival rates of people that do have cancer show, next slide, show that the earlier you detect that cancer, the greater the survival. And you can see stage one versus stage four, the five-year survival rates are significant. Well, it is the strong opinion of people that study colon cancer that screening should be done for colon cancer prevention and not simply colon cancer identification. That means we want to find the lesions before they become cancer. And we'll touch upon that towards the end when we talk about some of the economic implications of this. <clears throat> tests that we use for screening for colon cancer, there are tests that detect the polyps and the cancer. Those tend to be invasive. And there are tests that primarily detect cancer. Those are less invasive. The two tests I'm going to focus on are going to be colonoscopy and CT, colonography, and the tests that primarily detect cancer. I'm going to spend time just briefly talking about a FIT test, and then finally the stool DNA tests that are available. Next slide. Well, it's recommended that for the average person at 50 years old that you get one of these tests done, that something should be done, that either get a colonoscopy every 10 years, a CT colonography every five years, a sigmoidoscopic evaluation every five years with or without hemocult testing, stool tests, which are the hemocult tests, which would either be a guaiac or a FIT test, that, and there will be some samples available if people want to test themselves, and then finally a stool DNA test. The, the interval for testing for that has not yet been determined. Any screening test people need to do. If they don't do it, the screening test is useless. And for colon cancer, our adherence rates or compliance rates are not the greatest for a lot of reasons that you can imagine. And the, the, risk, the, the rates, just go back for a second, are much lower than other rates for, for screening cancers. Next slide. You can skip this one. There are definitely studies that show that screening for colon cancer can decrease the incidence of colorectal cancer by up to 70% and decrease the risk of mortality from colon cancer up to 30%. Colonoscopy is felt to be the gold standard by which the other screening tests I mentioned are, men are, are measured. Well, if you're going to get a colonoscopy for screening, how do you know it's a good one? And this is being well defined now by, by the societies of gastroenterology and surgery. There are four criteria that people look at for, a, for an adequate colonoscopy. The first one is, is what we call an adenoma detection rate. Basically, how many polyps do you find in people? This, the next three, cecal inhibition rates, prep quality, and withdrawal time, and I'll touch upon those briefly, all facilitate finding adenomas. So we believe if we remove adenomas, and there's some data to suggest this, that we can prevent you from getting colon cancer within the interval of you needing another colonoscopy. And that's very important. So in other words, if you get screened and you're called back, that in the interval of that recommendation, you do not develop a cancer. And that's what we call interval cancers. Next slide. Adenoma detection rate is pretty simple. Basically, it says, of the people you screen, how many have adenomas versus all the people you look at? And it is the strongest quality indicator associated with the development of interval cancers that I mentioned. There was a study out of Poland on that last line there that showed that if you had an adenoma detection rate of less than 20%, that you, had, you were 10 times more likely to develop an interval cancer than if your adenoma detection rate was higher than that. So who's ever doing the colonoscopy needs to look closely, so we try to remove these lesions. In women, the adenoma detection rate is 20% or greater, and in men, it's 30%. And this is age-related. Withdrawal time is pretty, pretty uh, self-explanatory, but what it means from an endoscopic point of view is once we reach the cecum, that part of the colon that I explained is the very beginning of the colon, but the end of the exam, from that moment to the time we withdraw, that's the withdrawal time. And it may be a gauge of how thorough the exam is. In other words, the longer time a, a someone takes, the better exam they get of the colon. And studies have shown that the average withdrawal time should be around six minutes. That's average. That doesn't mean everybody needs six minutes, but on the average, it should be six minutes. And the detection rate of polyps is much greater, as you can see. Cecal inhibition rate should be greater than 95%. In some of the studies that you may, in, you may hear about that show high risk of colon cancer, it's probably because these rates were not reached. I think I can speak for most of the gastroenterologists in this room. We probably reached the cecum 
plus percent of the time. It's rare that we don't get around. Finally, the prep. Anybody who's had a colonoscopy, oftentimes this is the most unpleasant part. This is two people being uh, directed to col colonoscopy by the devil, and he says the colonoscopy isn't your eternal punishment, the prep is. And for many of you who've had it, it's pretty bad. Split preps are better than a single prep. Basically what that means is you take half the prep the night before and half the prep four to six hours prior to the procedure. The better the prep, more polyps removed. These are a couple drawings, a couple pictures of bad preps. Good preps on the right, bad preps on the left. And you can see, it doesn't take much to see how you might miss lesions with the poor prep. And then finally, once you've had a colonoscopy, what do we recommend? And I don't really want to go into this, but your doctor will recommend a follow-up afterwards. And that'll depend on what's found at the time of your colonoscopy. Interval cancers, that I mentioned, these are important. These always distress, distress gastroenterologists because we hate to, we don't want to miss lesions, and we don't want to call people back too late. But we think most lesions arise because they were missed. 50% of cancers probably arise in the interval because we missed them. 25% may, may, may be new lesions that develop in the interval. And 20% may be lesions that we, we took off, but we may not have taken off completely. Some studies have shown recently that up to 9% of colon cancers are interval cancers. In other words, these are people that had colonoscopies. So as you can imagine, that's a little disconcerting for gastroenterologists. And then finally, the rates, however, are clearly higher, the interval rates of cancer, when these procedures are done by non-gastroenterologists. And I don't see any surgeons in the room, so I think I'm okay to say that. Complications are rare, but they happen. And when you have a colonoscopy, usually you're informed of these complications. People can bleed from polyps taken out. Rarely you can get a perforation of the colon. This should be less than one in a thousand times. Some of the sedation have, have risk. People get sedated. Sometimes they, they, their breathing will decline. They can get hypotensive. Usually these are manageable. And most of us who do colonoscopy in this community do not give heavy sedation. Throughout some parts of the country, people may get more general anesthesia or even propofol, which is more than conscious sedation. And then finally, infections. And infections are rare. This is not the kind of infection that's associated with the scopes that you may have read about, which look at the bile ducts. Those are ERCP scopes. These do not have the same implications. And these are stool-based tests. These are where you, you basically put fecal material on a card, and it's examined. And this is a, the patient comes to the doctor, and he, and he looks at her quizzically and says, what's this? And she said, well, I thought you said you wanted a sample of my number two, and she has a pencil in the jar. These are the two of the, the, the tests that are available. The most, the most recent and common fecal test would be a, what's called a FIT test or a fecal immunochemical test. And these can be done. I showed the sensitivities and specificities there. But then these are done throughout the country. If these tests are positive, patients go to colonoscopy. I want to touch upon two of the newer tests in case people have heard about this. One of them is virtual colonoscopy, which I don't think it is, it is offered in this community. And basically, this is a, a, a CT scan that looks for polyps. It's actually a, it's a good test. It picks up polyps. People are exposed to radiation, which may be of question. The false positive rates tend to be somewhat high. If you look at the large study, next slide. Uh, this was a large trial that came out about six years ago. The false positive rates are somewhat high, about 10 to 12 percent. I'm sorry, about anywhere from 20 to 12 to 12 percent. So all of those people that had a positive test are going to require a colonoscopy anyway. So this test is not yet approved by Medicare for screening. And then uh, if you have a polyp greater than six millimeters on colonography, it's recommended you go for colonoscopy. Stool testing is based on the fact that if you have a cancer or an advanced polyp, it's going to shed the genetic material that I, sh the alterations that I showed you earlier. I don't know if anyone has seen this. This has been published in many of the magazines, New York Times, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, USA Today. This is put out by Colaguard. This is a privately held company that has marketed this stool test. And it is, it is now approved by Medicare. It's about $515. But you can see that the, the false positive rate is relatively high, 13% out of the study that was just published recently, about a year and a half ago. These people will, will all go for colonoscopy and will not have a colon cancer. So then the problem is, what do you do with those people? I mean, are they shedding cellular abnormality from somewhere else? We don't know. But this is a test that is being more commonly done. And if you have any further questions about this after the discussion, I'd be more than happy to talk to you about it. I can, oh, we have a visitor. <laughs> I am an evil polyp. 
then I have come to take over. Yeah, see, Do Dr. Aguirre's good at lassoing the polyps. I, I, I wish it was always that simple. Sometimes it's not quite so simple. And then finally, I just wanted to end with some economic data, because this is very important, and this is how medical health care policy is developed, and it's extremely important that people go away with an understanding of this. As I mentioned, colon cancer is common. Two-thirds of the people diagnosed with colon cancer are of Medicare age. Whenever we do screening tests for cancer, there's something called a quality-adjusted life year. It's complicated how it's figured, but there is a monetary value placed on that. Anything less than $40,000 is felt to be cost-effective. To screen for colon cancer with all the tests I mentioned in the aggregate is about $20,000 a year. So the government feels that this is a cost-effective tool to use. The other important thing that I want to mention is the cost of treating advanced colon cancer over the past five years has increased significantly. The drugs available now are much more expensive than they were 10 years ago. We don't have any good cost analysis studies that I could find that have looked at cost using these new drugs, such as Avastin, Zolota, Folfox, all these different regimens that unfortunately people with advanced cancer have go through to try to prolong their survival, but the cost of that annually may be over $300,000. And then finally, there was a study, a, a model that was done by Medicare, next slide, and basically what it showed that if you took a population, these are models, this wasn't actually done, took a population aged 50 to 64, pre-Medicare age, screened them with either a cult blood, a fit test, or colonoscopy, and then, and then followed that group till they were 75. The cost savings for Medicare, including the cost of screening, over that period for colonoscopy was up to $22 billion, and for, for doing fecal occult blood tests was $18 billion. So these are significant amounts of money. And then finally, the study suggested that the earlier you get screened, the greater the benefit. And then finally, I just want to leave you with a few notes. Screening reduces the, the colorectal cancer incidence and death rates. Colonoscopy may be the gold standard, and then finally, any recommended screening test is better than no test. So if there's, if there's um, reticence to do colonoscopy or have any invasive test, you should do a non-invasive test because any test is better for screening. It may result in a lot of false positive tests, but it's a way to, protect col to detect colon cancer and prevent lives. So thank you very much. I saw I went over a little bit. Thanks, Jim. It, it, it's a lot of information, and it, it means a lot to us that do it, and hopefully he's imparted to you at least some of the things that we think about a lot when we're talking about colon cancer screening and prevention. It's now my pleasure to introduce Sarah Washburn, who's a registered dietitian and board-certified specialist in oncology nutrition. She was affiliated with a very large cancer center in the Pacific Northwest for over 10 years prior to coming to join us. She currently supports our patients throughout the care continuum, from prevention through treatments and on to survivorship here at the Cancer Center of Santa Barbara. Please welcome Sarah Washburn. Hello. So today what we're gonna do is talk about nutrition and exercise related to colorectal cancer. And we're gonna review some highlights from a big study that was actually initially published in 2007 and it's been updated year after year after year. In this, in this presentation, and we're gonna talk about the risk factors associated with um, colorectal cancer, those factors that increase your risk versus those that decrease your risk. So I wanna give you a little perspective. 50% of colorectal cancers could be prevented by weight management, diet, and exercise. And that boils down to about 67,000 cases a year could be prevented by changes in our lifestyle, by weight management, and um, by diet changes. So here are the factors that are most likely to increase your risk of getting colorectal cancer. 
And I want you to know that these, the, the reason why these are in the most likely category is because there's convincing evidence that there is an association between these factors and this particular cancer. So the first one um, is red meat. And red meat is considered beef, pork, and lamb. And the, the mechanism behind this is quite, uh, it, we really don't know, but there are factors such as um, the inflammatory process of the meat may have an impact on the cancer. Um, the way we cook meat, we heat it to a very high temperature and there are cancer-causing properties that um, are developed during the heating process. One of them is called poly, um, uh, heterocyclic amines and poly, I don't know why I'm, I'm having this blank, you know what it is, aromatic carbons. The bottom line is these particular compounds um, are cancer causing. So I tell people, cook your meat at a lower temperature. Even if the direction says, cook it at 400, cook things at 350 or lower, you will get less of these compounds uh, developed. Processed meats, what are processed meats? Processed meats refer to meats that are treated by salting, curing, fermenting, smoking, or other processes that enhance flavor or preserve the food. Um, most of them contain pork or beef, and they include some, some examples are hot dogs and ham, sausages, corned beef, which some of you may be eating tomorrow, <laughs> and beef jerky. Um, again, the mechanism behind this particular um, food type in relation to cancer is there are some different compounds that it may create um, that are inflammatory in nature. Um, alcohol, that's another one. It's more um, associated uh, for men than for women. Um, the recommendation if you do want to drink is to have no more than two drinks per day if you're a man and one drink for women. What is considered a drink? A drink is five ounces of wine, 12 ounces of beer, or 1.5 ounces of hard liquor, okay? So the next one, body fatness. So this is your body weight, your body mass index. Staying as lean as possible has a benefit for you in relation to your risk for colorectal cancer. Um, there are a variety of mechanisms that have been proposed, uh, anywhere from insulin resistance to the uh, creation of insulin, um, cytokines, inflammation, it goes on and on. Uh, fat's a bad thing to have in relation to colorectal cancer and many other cancers. And the last one is abdominal fatness. So those people that have that pear shape where they have a, a wider waist, um, get a measuring tape and once a year, just like you check your blood sugar or whatever you do at the doctors, put a measuring tape around your waist and see what your waist circumference is. For women, it's ideal to have it to be 31 and a half inches or less, and for men, it's 37 inches or less. So again, a number that you can track and watch and see um, what your waist circumference is doing over time. Okay, these are factors that may increase your risk, so they're not as convincing evidence, but they still may increase your risk. One of them are foods that contain iron, specifically heme iron. So these are more um, meats and seafood. Uh, cheese as well has been associated with colorectal cancer. And as far as I'm concerned, cheese seems to be everywhere, right? It's in everything. It's all over the place. Um, and I advise you, if you eat cheese, to just be mindful. How often are you having it? Are you having cheese in your omelet and cheese in your sandwich and cheese in your, with your spaghetti and cheese as a snack and it, cheese is, is very popular. Um, if you look at the USDA statistics on the consumption of cheese in the last 20 years, it's just astounding. Um, ice cream has gone down and cheese has gone up. And then foods that contain animal fats. So these, you know, this is your, your meats, this is butter, um, sour cream, cream, those kinds of things. Another association. And finally, foods that contain sugar, specifically sucrose and fructose. So look at labels. If you see those on the label, even high fructose corn syrup, 
there could be an association uh, related to having that food in your, in your diet. Next slide. Okay, so now let's talk about how to decrease risk of colorectal cancer. The first one I'm gonna talk about is physical activity. So if you can exercise or move 30 minutes a day, every day, and that some kind of moderate intensity, we talk brisk walking or running or dancing, you can see those options, or even surfing, that has a, a benefit for you. Um, it has, again, many of the, the mechanisms seem to have an anti-inflammatory effect. This, this theme of inflammation is very prevalent in all of these factors. Um, this particular activity helps decrease inflammation, thus decreasing your risk of colorectal cancer. Next slide. Most likely to decrease risk, fiber. Fiber will be talked about quite a bit, um, probably by your primary care doctors, your, um, your, your family members. Um, it's the thing in plants that um, kind of cleans out your intestines. It makes things go down, your, go down the pipe relatively quickly. Um, it also helps make something called short chain fatty acids down in your colon, which have a protective effect, a health effect for you. And the recommendation is to shoot for about 25 to 40 grams a day, and some recommendations are even higher than that. That's a really good question. Here's my little thing here. Okay, let's start. To, let's see how much you can, uh, fiber you can get. So if you have an egg, fiber? So no fiber in eggs. Okay, if you have some nuts, just a little Trader Joe pack of nuts, four grams of fiber. So you're four grams on your way to 40 grams, right? Or at least 25 grams. This table is crooked, which makes this a little challenging, but it's all right, an apple. Another four grams, you have to eat the skin too, okay? You're up to eight grams. Okay, now a cup of broccoli. It could be cooked, not cooked. It could be put in a blender, in a smoothie. If you juice it and leave the pulp out, do you get the fiber? No. Keep the fiber in, okay? Another three to four grams, five, around there. All right, um, blueberries. Everybody loves blueberries. Of course they have fiber. A cup of blueberries, four grams of fiber. So now we're up to about 20 grams. Sweet potato with the skin, four grams. I feel like an auctioneer here. <laughs> 24 grams of fiber. Okay, now you want to put a teaspoon of butter on that broccoli. Fiber? No. No fiber in that. All right, what about um, avocado? Loaded. This is a little guy. This has about nine grams of fiber. You're up to 33 grams of fiber so far. Yeah. And then black beans, one of my favorite sources. Half of this can has about 15 grams of fiber. Okay? So you're up to 48 grams of fiber with that that combination of foods. And the last one, I will, hang on one minute. I was gonna bring some chicken in, but I didn't have any chicken in my house, so I brought Odette. And Odette is, he happens to be an ostrich. But if you were to eat three ounces of Odette, which is about the size of the palm of your hand, would it have any fiber? No. So animal products in general don't have fiber, okay? So plants, 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 plants. <laughs> All right, next slide. And this just shows you some beautiful plants. Okay, other um, possible ways to decrease risk of colorectal cancer, garlic. Eat an abundance of garlic, and if we all eat an abundance of garlic, then no one has to worry about having garlic breath <laughs> because we'll all have it. Um, milk is a really... 
it can be, you know, my vote on many of these things, whether it's talking about tomatoes or cooking broccoli or raw broccoli or garlic cooked or not, do all of it, all right? Eat it cooked, eat it crushed. Crushing it really is what you're looking for if it's cooked or raw. It's the crushing process that really activates it. Yum, sounds perfect. Milk products can also, um, specifically milk, has uh, an impact on decreasing risk, as well as, um, as Dr. Egan said, um, calcium. I would warn you, though, there's some new data on calcium supplements in relation to heart disease in a negative light, meaning, meaning too much calcium supplementation may have a negative impact on heart disease or may result in more heart disease. So the bottom line is if you're thinking about taking a calcium supplement, it's worth talking to your doctor, talking to a nutritionist, getting your diet analyzed to find out how much calcium you have in your diet first before you consider taking a supplement. A supplement. Um, you know, many people get prescribed 12 or 1500 milligrams of calcium in their diet through a supplement, and when I go assess their diet, they're getting 12 or 1500 milligrams from their diet, which is way more calcium than is appropriate. Um, may decrease risk of colorectal cancer, non-starchy vegetables. These really, to me, are the workhorses of your diet. These are the ones that don't have a lot of calories. They have phytonutrients, phytoestrogens. They're, there's carotenoids. There's vitamins and minerals. The synergy between all the compounds in these foods are the ones that I think have you know, the most impact on your health in general, including your risk to decrease, your ability to decrease your risk of cancer, including colorectal cancer. Fruits as well include those. Vitamin D, whether you get it from the sun or whether you get it from food or whether you get it from supplements. Have your vitamin D level checked. It really, I moved here from Seattle about five years ago. I used to see a lot of vitamin D levels that were low there and I see just as money here. So I think it's worth getting it checked. And my final comments are, please make sure that you take care of your gut. If you have, in order to, to optimize your nutritional health, you have to ingest food, digest it, absorb it, utilize it, and eliminate it. And if you have problems with any of those, you could compromise your nutritional health. So come talk to somebody, you know, nutritionist, whoever is available that can give you input on how to optimize your digestion. You shouldn't be constipated, gassy. We can do things around your diet choices to help minimize some of those side effects and optimize your nutritional health. And finally, eat your greens. Everybody needs to eat their greens. So up on the slide uh, on our table, we have some um, veggies for you to have and some hummus and bean dip if you'd like. And also there's a handout that's available with, with many of these concepts on it so that you can take it home. Okay? Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. I have to say that if I had 47 grams of fiber, I'd pretty much jet propelled around this place here. Um, Last and, and not least, I'm, I'm very happy to introduce Hannah Andrews, who's a graduate of both UC San Diego and the University of South Carolina, where she, she received her master's degree in genetic counseling. And what we have been finding more recently with some of our better equipment, better preps, is we're finding a lot more patients with a number of polyps. And at a certain point, it makes you think that maybe there's something wrong with this colon or something abnormal about this colon. And that's where Hannah and her colleagues come in in terms of the genetic evaluation for people that are at even greater risk of cancer than the average. So please welcome Hannah, who's going to give us a little rundown. All right, I am a little bit too short. There we go. Can everyone hear me? So I'm going to talk to you guys about understanding your predisposition to develop colorectal cancer. Um, and first of all, I just want to clarify that this talk and what I'm about to speak to you about is not going to uh, relate to everyone in this room today. Really, when we talk about colorectal cancer, most cancer that we see in families is actually going to be sporadic or happens randomly by chance, typically at a younger age of onset. Um, when we are thinking about colon cancers that can be inherited or that are hereditary in a family, this is only a small portion of colon cancers. Just gonna, can you still hear me now? Okay, excellent. 
Um, and so these small portion of hereditary colon cancers, they happen because of a change or a misspelling in a gene or what we call a mutation. And so those mutations can actually increase a person's chance to develop different types of cancers. And these changes can be passed from generation to generation from either your mother's side or your father's side. And so certain clues that we have to look to see if uh, cancers that are in families are actually hereditary which are on the slide right now already, thank you, um, is if anyone's been diagnosed with cancer under the age of 50, if multiple people in multiple generations have been diagnosed either with the same type of cancer or a related type of cancer, if anyone's ever been diagnosed with more than one type of cancer, um, or if we see any rare cancers, any unusual cancers, and then sometimes ethnicity can also play a role in certain conditions that we look at. So the most common hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome that I'm going to talk about today is Lynch syndrome. And so Lynch syndrome is caused by misspellings in certain genes that lead to an increased chance to develop colon cancer as well as other types of cancer. So Lynch syndrome actually accounts for 1 to 3 percent of all colorectal cancers. Um, I have to admit that I was excited to give this talk today. Um, I think that as a community, we can really do better in recognizing and identifying these patients with Lynch syndrome. About one in 440 people have Lynch syndrome, but it's severely underdiagnosed. And so our whole motto of this talk is prevention is priceless and colon cancer is preventable. And so we want to find these families that have a higher chance to develop colon cancer and get them the screenings that they need. Um, you know, in Lynch syndrome, we were talking about maybe getting colonoscopies and, and how polyps take a longer time to develop. And so you can have a colonoscopy and then you can have another one in five years and we would hopefully detect, t remove those polyps. In Lynch syndrome, those polyps actually turn to colon cancer faster than in the general population. And so we would actually recommend that you have more frequent colonoscopies. You have them every one to two years. And you would also start a lot earlier. So you wouldn't start at 50. If you have Lynch syndrome, you would want to start at 20 or 25 years old. So definitely a lot earlier. And we would hopefully be able to prevent these families from developing these cancers. Um, so we've seen families that have come into our clinic and they have a strong family history of colon cancer, their father was diagnosed with colon cancer, their aunt was diagnosed with colon cancer, a cousin was also diagnosed with a young colon cancer, and maybe their grandmother passed away from colon cancer. And so these families, they are aware of their family history of colon cancer. And they said, you know, I'm talking to my healthcare provider about this. I know that I'm at an increased risk because so many people in my family have had colon cancer. And so I want to get those colonoscopies. I want to get them earlier and I want to get them a little bit more frequently. And so when they come to genetic counseling, they're often confused about what we can do and, and how genetic testing for Lynch syndrome would be helpful for them. And they're kind of like, well, I'm already doing my screening. I already know that I'm at this increased risk. What, what else can you offer me? And so with that, when we do genetic testing for Lynch syndrome, what we're really trying to find is we're trying to find the reason for these colon cancers in the family. And we want to then be able to test other people in the family and see, are you really at that increased risk that you think you are? And in that case, we would want to say, yes, we definitely need to do colonoscopies more frequently. Maybe there's other screenings in place that we also need to do. Also, we can test family members and we can find out that they don't have that gene change. They're not at an increased risk to develop colon cancer. And that can be such a big relief for people when they've spent their whole life thinking, you know, when am I going to get colon cancer? When is it going to hit me? And so in that case, we can really tell people, you know, you don't need your extra screening. You can just have your colonoscopy at 50 and have them however often your doctor tells you to do after that. So... And, and also, there's other types of cancer that are associated with Lynch syndrome. So the family that I talked about earlier, they're only concerned about their risk for colon cancer. They know that they have a high chance to develop colon cancer. 
But in Lynch syndrome, you also have a high chance to develop endometrial cancer as well as other types of cancer. And so when we identify these families, we can actually add in new screening measures and other preventative steps that can be potentially life-saving. So that's a big plus to come to genetic counseling, see if you need some testing done. Um, and, and also on the note of endometrial cancer, most often in, in a lot of families we will see that maybe endometrial cancer, an early onset, was the only cancer or the first cancer that really gave us our clue that maybe there's something going on in the family. And so in these families, who maybe they only have uh, an endometrial cancer that was diagnosed at 38, typically endometrial cancer in Lynch syndrome has a pretty good prognosis, and so maybe they went through treatment and it's been so long ago that they've just kind of forgotten about it and put it in the back of their heads. But if we're able to identify those families and we're able to see them just based on the fact that they had a young endometrial cancer, then we can also offer them preventative colonoscopies and hopefully be able to prevent any other cancers from occurring. Um, you may be thinking, how does one come to genetic counseling? You know, how, how do I do this? Do I just sign up? What, what happens here? And so just a little behind the scenes is that we are actually working with the pathology department at Cottage Hospital, and we're developing a system that identifies people who have been diagnosed with colon cancer or endometrial cancer. And through a specific type of tumor testing that is done, we are able to see if maybe they're at an increased chance to, be, to have Lynch syndrome. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier, people who have had colon cancer or endometrial cancer in the past, we still want to capture that population. You know, we, we don't want that population to slip through the cracks. And I know sometimes that it might be difficult to bring up someone's previous um, cancer diagnosis, or maybe you don't want to think about it. But that person can be really critical link to help diagnose a family with Lynch syndrome. Um, and then, of course, again, our motto is prevention, prevention, prevention. We want to find those people who have not been affected with cancer, and we, but they're at a higher risk, and we want to be able to offer them more screening, and we want to be able to prevent any additional cancers or any cancers from occurring. And so in that case, I would say the best way to get to genetic counseling is to talk to your health care provider. Tell them about your family history. Ask them about genetic counseling. Ask them if they think genetic testing would be a good fit for your family based on the cancer that's in there. You know, ask them if just based on the cancer, are there any additional screening recommendations that you can do? Or any, anything else that maybe genetic testing isn't a good fit, but something else that you can do just to make sure you're getting the right preventative strategies in place. Um, and again, keep in mind when you talk to your family about your family history, which is so critical, that keep in mind if anyone's been diagnosed under the age of 50, multiple people in multiple generations who are closely related, if anyone's been diagnosed with the same type of cancer, a related type of cancer, um, like colon and endometrial cancer in Lynch syndrome, if anyone's been diagnosed with a very rare type of cancer, a very unusual type of cancer, that's always a key. And then if, if there is a known hereditary cancer syndrome in your family, we want to see you. Tell your healthcare provider. We, we want you to come in and talk to us. Um, and of course, there are many different hereditary colon cancer syndromes. And I only am going to talk about Lynch syndrome. And uh, Dr. Egan mentioned some polyposis conditions um, where there's multiple, multiple polyps in the colon, anywhere from 10 to thousands of them. Um, there's also other hereditary colorectal cancer syndromes. And so the, my best advice there is talk to your healthcare provider. If there's anything in your family or anything in your personal history that you're a little concerned about or think might be not quite normal, talk to them. And if they think that it's something that, yeah, actually let's send you to genetics, please come and see us. Yes. Well, so smoking does increase the chance to develop colon cancer, but not, um, not really related to Lynch syndrome. So it doesn't increase your chance to develop Lynch syndrome. You're born with that mutation. 
Yes. Yes. So typically with Lynch syndrome, um, you will have an increased chance to develop colon cancer. It can be up to 80% over a person's lifetime. So there's not really a symptom of Lynch syndrome. It's not something where I'd be able to say, you know, oh, you have colon cancer and you feel like this, this, and this. It's more of a pattern that we see in a family history or um, in an individual. If someone's been diagnosed with what we call Lynch syndrome-related cancers. So if someone was diagnosed with colon cancer and endometrial cancer, then we would consider maybe they have Lynch syndrome. Maybe they have this gene change that they were born with that is causing this increased chance to develop these cancers. Yes. Yes, Lynch syndrome is the most common hereditary colorectal cancer syndrome. Um, so again, just want to clarify, there's a, a lot of other colon cancer syndromes. Um, we hope that you'll be able to come to genetic counseling, and, and with that, we would be able to change the family story that people talk about of, you know, everyone in my family gets colon cancer too. Well, people in my family used to get colon cancer. We know that we're at this higher chance. We get screened, and now no one's been diagnosed. That's all. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Wow, thank you. Um, Mike, did you want to say a few things? Okay. Let, Mike, the group. Hi, I'm uh, Mike McGrew, and uh, <clears throat> I've grown up in this community, and I've been a police officer for the last 30 years, and been able to serve this community. It's just a wonderful, wonderful place Santa Barbara is. And, uh, you know, part of the community that I've really just always honored and cherished is just the medical staff that we have here available uh, in this community. Just being a cop and going into the ER rooms and the, seeing how they operate, the doctors, nurses, the staff, <clears throat> and also the trauma people. But uh, uh, I was touched more than once by cancer in, in my life. My youngest son uh, was 12 years old when he was diagnosed with bone cancer. And he had a six year battle and he passed away when he was 18 years old. My wife, Nicole, is a cancer survivor as well. And um, so it, it's, it's, it's a battle that I, I'm familiar with and, and, I, and I know it's not an easy battle. Um, one of the things that, that happened to me was uh, <clears throat> I, I didn't have any symptoms. And uh, I just went to the doctor, I'm 52 years old now, and at 50 the doctor said, go get a colonoscopy, and, and I didn't. And then I went the next year, and my doctor looked me right in the eye and said, you know what, this is 100% preventable, colon, uh, colon cancer is, they can just find the polyps, get rid of them, and you're, you're back on the road. And there was something in her eye that made me say, okay, you know what, I'll go in and I'll do that. So one of my new heroes is Dr. Egan, who spoke earlier, and uh, he did my colonoscopy. And when he did it, he found what he described was the third biggest polyp he'd ever seen. And uh, it was the size of a fist, probably a normal person's fist, not mine, but it was, uh, it was there, and it was stage three uh, colon cancer, and it gone into my lymph nodes, uh, so it required surgery. Uh, Dr. Graney, who's a wonderful uh, surgeon, went in and they cut out part of my colon and uh, some lymph nodes, they th I think they took about 50 of those, and I had uh, cancer in two. Because of that, uh, uh, the cancer was all gone. They were able to get rid of the cancer, so I'm cancer-free. Uh, you know, I praise God for that right now. But I also, <laughs> thank you. But I, but I also have to uh, uh, <clears throat> go through chemotherapy, so I'm doing that right now. I'm in the middle of that battle, which is, that's no fun, but, uh, but it's something I gotta do until, June, and then I'll be back on the streets. But I, I'm just here, just, uh, they asked me, they said, hey, would you like to be the poster guy for colon cancer? I'm like, I guess, you know? <laughs> so, so the next thing I knew, I was like, I was everywhere. And uh, there was posters everywhere, and my wife's going, I, I can't you know, go to the bathroom without seeing you at the, at the hospital. And, and then I had some guy today that he waved me down, and he's like, you're the colon cancer guy, and he wanted a selfie with me, and so I got to... <laughs> So anyways, it's, it's been an, a, an amazing experience being the colon cancer poster boy, but, 
But I'm very glad that Samson's doing this. I want to thank Samson for putting this on, uh, for educating us all. I wish I would have seen a lot of this information myself before uh, I went in for my colonoscopy. But I, I urge you to, you know, do what they're telling you to do. Pay attention because it all, it all matters. And and I just like to thank Samson, just their staff, the cancer center. Just uh, it, talk about wonderful hearts, wonderful people. They're here for the cause, and uh, and we are just blessed to have. Uh, this this type of treatment in our in our community. So I just want to thank you all for being here tonight, and uh, and thank you for putting this on for us. Thanks, Mike. Well, we need to thank our speakers, of course, but also the nurses and technicians at both the Cottage Hospital Endoscopy Lab and the Sansom Endoscopy Lab, as well as the people from the Cancer Foundation who put so much effort into this um, night for us to become educated about colon cancer. I want to make sure everybody takes a few minutes to fill out those intake forms. Uh, it was on your seat, and there are nurses stationed around the building that would be happy to take them from you. If you have not been screened for colon cancer, which of course, I mean, I can't imagine anybody would not be screened. I've been screened. If you've not already been screened, we have representatives from several of the places to get screened for colon cancer around the corner there, and they'd be happy to schedule one for you. Sarah and the genetic counselors will be available to answer questions, and the physicians will be available over at the Ask the Doc table if you have any questions for them. You can also join a raffle and have your picture taken with Polyp Girl, who did an amazing job of being avoided for a while. And on behalf of everybody that um, put the effort into this tonight, thank you for being here, and please um, pass the message. We want to stamp out cancer.